Welcome to Exceptional Leadership. I'm your host, Anita Brooks. Though my focus is primarily pointed to leadership at an organizational level, let me assure you, most of what I share will translate to almost any aspect of life. Just tweak the info to fit your leadership role. Because whether you approach my content as a corporate leader, middle manager, small business owner, entrepreneur, or as a family member or friend, you are influencing someone. The question is, are you influencing well, exceptionally well? So let's take courage, exercise wisdom, and humbly invest in the people we are called to influence. Join me on a quest, not for perfection, but absolutely for exceptional leadership. Welcome back to Exceptional Leadership. Well, today we're going to do part two of a conversation because sometimes when you are talking to someone, you just don't want it to end. And that's the way it's been with Dr. Craig Von Busick. As we were talking about his book, Forward, The Leadership Principles of Ulysses S. Grant. And Craig, there is so much that to me is relevant to leadership today. And as I read your book, more and more, I feel like we are in some ways losing the lost art of exceptional leadership. But in your writings about Grant, I feel like we can bring some of that back. So welcome back, Greg, and let's plunge in. Well, thank you, Anita. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I couldn't agree with you more. I, as a student of history, there are exceptional examples of leadership that we see throughout not only American history, but history in general. And uh, Ulysses S. Grant is certainly one of those. He is, Craig. And and you you brought out so many of the nuances of his leadership characteristics and style, and I'd love to plunge into them. Many of those you talk about at the end of your chapters. I love the way you tell the stories and we see that, but at the end of the chapters, you really drive that home for us because you point out some things we might otherwise miss. And one of the things that you talked about in, in chapter three was his diligence. So why do you think, number one, maybe give us an example of Grant's diligence, but why do you think that that is a necessary characteristic for exceptional leadership? Well, Grant was a quartermaster in the Mexican-American War, and he did his job with uh, such detail and such precision that it came to the attention of his commanding general, Zachary Taylor, who later became president. And um, Taylor saw Grant working and getting things uh, ready. And one example is they were, uh, there were some barriers out in the, in the ocean, in the Gulf of Mexico, and they needed to be moved so that the transport ships could get in. And this was at a time when there were no cranes or anything like that. So the men had to go out and move them, and and they were kind of not being very um, aggressive about this, and it was holding everything up. And so the officer usually just told the you know troops what to do, and they went and did it. Well, in this case, Grant saw that there was a problem, and so he went out into the water, and he showed them what needed to be done. And Taylor just happened to be coming up on his horse. And he heard some of the other other officers uh, criticizing Grant and saying, what is he doing? He's not supposed to be out there. And Taylor quieted them and said, no, that is exactly the kind of leader I'm looking for. And so Grant rose in Zachary Taylor's eyes and uh, became a very important part of the Army during the Mexican-American War. That carried over then into the other Uh, roles that Grant had. And wherever he was, he was a person that made sure that the details were taken care of. And he always thought ahead. He was always planning for the future. He wasn't just living in the today, but he was always thinking kind of like a a research and development department in a good organization is always out there testing and looking at what's coming up ahead. And that's basically how Grant operated. As you were talking about that, it made me think of a leader today that just fascinates me. So it's been probably been about three or four years ago now. I was reading about the king of Dubai 
And many people are familiar with all of these magnificent islands that he's built out where there were no islands. And one of the things that fascinated me was that his people kept telling him, his engineers and his architects, it can't be done. It can't be done. And this king, you talk about diligence. He was determined you're going to figure out how it will be done. And I think sometimes a good leader pushes their people first by setting the example like Grant did and what you just shared, but then also in that tenacity of saying, we're not going to give up until we overcome this problem. And I think that is another uh, characteristic that, that Grant exhibited. Yeah, an excellent example of that was the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, the Confederates felt that they uh, that Vicksburg was impenetrable. Uh, it sat up high on a bluff uh, overlooking the Mississippi River, and then it had swamps and bayous to the north. And um, so there was it, – it was like the Union was not able to get in. So in 1862, the Union Navy came up the Mississippi River. They were easily able to take New Orleans, but when they got to Vicksburg – they couldn't take it because their guns were not able to get up high enough. They they weren't able to get troops up. Whenever troops tried to attack, uh, you know, the Confederates were on the very high ground and were easy, easily able to see what was happening and, and defeat them. Grant had tried several different ways uh, to get to Vicksburg, including uh, during the winter uh, between 1862 and 1863, uh, he actually had men that were out in the water cutting down trees under the water line to try to allow the boats to get through the Yazoo River and some other uh, waterways. He couldn't do that. And so then he set them to digging a canal. And their whole purpose was to go around the defenses of Vicksburg by digging a, a trench and allowing the Mississippi to flow in a new direction. Oh my goodness. Uh, that trench is actually still there. Uh, it didn't work at the time. They just didn't have enough, you know, now they possibly could do it with our, you know, hydraulic steam shovels and, and so forth. But back then they, it was just people, you know, the army was down in the dirt digging and uh, unfortunately it didn't work, but the whole time that these things were happening, Grant was envisioning another plan, and uh, he had to wait uh, for this plan for the uh, for the rains to stop, for the sun to come out in the spring, and for the Louisiana side of the river to dry up. And then what he did was that they went in and they repaired any parts of the road or the levees that had been washed out. Uh, they built a bunch of bridges and and laid down uh, what they would call corduroy roads where they would cut trees in half and lay them down and they would literally be like corduroys and uh, drive right over the trees. And uh, they were able to get down secretly to the southern side, which was left unguarded, pretty much unguarded by the Confederates. And uh, Sherman, you know, said to him, this is impossible. You're not going to be able to do this. And uh, Grant said, I, you know, I feel confident that we can do it. They kept charging ahead, moving ahead. And finally, they were able to, you know, the roads dried up enough, the bridges were in place, and they moved the armies down secretly. They crossed uh, with the help of a, a slave who saw what was going on. He came and said to them, there's a safe crossing at Bruinsburg. And they went down and scouted it out. Sure enough, it was. They came across, it was the largest amphibious movement of American troops, I think, until D-Day. Wow. And they moved the whole army across the Mississippi River and attacked from the south, which was basically undefended, and uh, then came around, um, got in between two Confederate armies and kept them separate, and uh, ended up surrounding uh, Vick Vicksburg with a siege and taking that city. And it was because... He had worked out the whole plan in his mind in those cold months of winter while they were trying everything else. He was making a plan, but he had to wait until all of the things came into line, including the roads drying up. So he was very much a strategist, and that was how he uh, obtained victory. And it's so fascinating. And, and he was innovative 
that's and he pushed his people to be innovative, which a lot of times great leaders will do that as well. And and as you're describing that, you know, I'm in Missouri, so I'm very familiar with the Mississippi River, and I know <laughs> where we live. Crossing the Mississippi, it, it could feel like ca- crossing an ocean, and probably right. without having today's technology, it did. But because of his leadership, they were and, and his willingness to listen to someone else too. I, I think about his openness to listening to this slave. You know, some leaders would have been stubborn right. and discounted because he's just a slave after all, but n- but not Grant. And yeah. I, I think that is a great point for us to kind of camp on and, and be mindful of as well. As leaders, yeah. it's not just what we say, but sometimes it's our willingness to hear other people as well that helps us be innovative. And another side of that is that during that winter of 62-63, the uh, newspapers were merciless on Grant. They said, he's a fool. He's out out there and wasting his troops. And there were, sadly, several troops that died of disease during that time uh, because they were working in the swamps. And that was a tragedy. But Grant looked at it as, we're going to try every possibility here. And the other side of it, he said, you know, it's much better for the troops to be working than to be idle, because if they're working, they'll be that much stronger when we push through. And he was absolutely right. He, yes, he was. And he was so visionary. I want to switch gears a little bit, Craig, and I want to talk about another leadership trait that you delved into in chapter four that I believe in. But in today's world, there are some who would say, Oh, that, that's too warm and fuzzy for me, or that makes me feel awkward or uncomfortable. But talk about lost art of leadership. Leading with love is a very important aspect for those who want to be exceptional in what they accomplish, in how they are and how they interact with other people. So talk to us a little bit about how Grant led with love And then if you don't mind, also maybe tell us why you think leading with love is still important today. I absolutely believe in the concept of leading with love. uh, And Grant demonstrated it uh, through his uh, democratic approach to leadership. He was very open and he listened to his people. And that really goes hand in hand with the Deming model of leadership where you recognize that you want to bring in advisors and people on your staff who are in their area of expertise are smarter than you are. Mm -hmm. Collins in Good to Great talks about not only having the right people on the bus, but having the right people in the right seats on the bus. And we miss that a lot. Leaders miss that a lot. The weak leaders try to surround themselves with people who will just be in agreement with themselves. And it causes all kinds of blindness in the organization because you are not capable, especially when your organization gets larger, you're not, you're simply not capable of seeing what's going on in all the different facets and, and aspects of what that organization is doing. You actually are blinded because you have to have people who are very talented in in the positions and you need to delegate to them a certain level of authority and a certain level of trust in order for the organization to work the way that it uh, needs to. And Grant was just, uh, he was a genius at this. He understood that concept. And so he surrounded himself with people who were some of the best and the brightest. An example was Horace Porter. If you really want to get a glimpse of who Ulysses S. Grant was, besides reading my two books about him, (laughs) I would recommend that you read Campaigning with Grant by Horace Porter. Porter was an excellent leader. Grant had seen his leadership in Chattanooga, which was a a terrible situation. Former general before Grant had allowed the Confederates to surround and cut off the federal army Uh, from their supplies, and they were choking to death. The army was choking to death. Mm. And so Grant was called upon by Lincoln to uh, get in there 
kind of solve the problem, which he did by opening up uh, a new supply line. They called it the cracker line, where they were bringing in the crackers to feed the troops and the and the hay to feed the horses and so forth. But uh, one of the people that really showed their leadership was Horace Porter. And Grant saw this in Chattanooga. He also saw it in uh, Phil Sheridan in Chattanooga. And so when Grant went east in 1864, so that it was the best northern general against the best southern general, which, you know, was Grant against Lee, Grant brought with him several of these people that he saw as being, you know, some of the best and the brightest. He brought Sheridan, he brought Sherman, he brought Porter with him because he knew that he needed people that he could trust people that had proven themselves to him. And so he put these people into place. He also brought his chief of, of staff, John Rollins, who had been a lawyer for Grant's father before the war. Grant's father had a chain of leather goods stores and Grant had come north to work for his father. He, you know, he humbled himself because he had had uh, difficulty running his own farm. And so he, called his dad or reached out to his dad and came up north and worked for his father in a very lowly position because he needed to take care of his family. And yet he also could see that war was coming and he wanted to be moved from St. Louis, which was, they weren't sure, as you know, living there in Missouri, they didn't know if Missouri would go north or south. Mm -hmm. And so he moved north to Illinois, uh, to Galena, and that's where he met John Rollins, the lawyer for his dad's store. And they really saw in each other great strengths. And yet they also saw in each other great weaknesses. And so each other's strength upheld each other's weakness. And uh, Grant uh, brought him with him east. Even before this, uh, Grant had reached out to Rollins and Rollins had seen Grant's problem with alcoholism because Rollins father was an alcoholic. And so Grant uh, had come to Rollins uh, when, when Grant was named Brigadier General and he said, I want you to be my chief of staff. And, and Rollins said, the only way I will do that is if you promise not to drink. Mm. And Grant said, I'll make you a deal. I will promise that if you will promise to be my chief of staff. And Rollins said, well, only if you'll allow me to keep you accountable. And Grant said, that's a deal. And that was one of the ways that Grant overcame his alcoholism. And so he brought uh, these great leaders with him and put them in place. So, for example, the cavalry in the East had, had been beaten time and time again by Jeb Stewart and the Confederate cavalry um, during the first three years of the war. And Grant knew this was a problem. And so even though Sheridan had been over infantry, uh, Grant said, uh, I'm going to place Sheridan over the cavalry because I know he'll whip them into shape. And, uh, he, you know, there were a lot of people, including George Meade, who was the head of the Army of the Potomac, who were upset with this. But Grant said, I, you know, I'm, I, I accept your input, but this is what we're going to do. And so Sheridan and Meade uh, constantly were coming at each other uh, because they saw things differently. But Grant continued to overrule Meade and say, no, let Sheridan be Sheridan, take him off the leash. And when he did that, not only did he beat uh, the Southern Confederates or the Southern Cavalry, but within a very short time, Jeb Stewart was dead, killed by the Northern Cavalry. And from then on, the Northern Cavalry had dominance. So that's just, you know, I could give you example after example like after example where Grant understood that the whole aspect of love is not just the, you know, kind of affectionate love that we would think of, but love is kind of doing what Jesus said, and that is the golden rule to love your neighbor as you would love yourself. And so Grant did that by listening by having a very democratic type of gathering uh, at meals. You know, he didn't come in with pomp and ceremony. He wore a very simple uh, outfit. Uh, he wore basically an infantry outfit, uh, 
And the only way you could tell that he was the general commanding general were by the stars on his shoulders. That was the only way. Everything else looked just like everybody else. So uh, Shelby Foote, uh, a great writer and historian, said he was a a dust-covered man on a dust-covered horse. And that's the kind of leader that you want. I love that. And what strikes me with what you were sharing was the strength the inner strength that Grant had, the confidence that he he didn't have to try to surround himself by people that he could feel superior to. Exactly. He We use the word empower a lot in leadership today, but I think like so many other terms, if you use it enough, you start losing what the, it really means, the identity of that word. But to empower people is exactly what Grant did, where he cared enough about them to see their strengths, to not try to diminish that, but actually to try to enhance it. And so because of that, he was a better leader. There was greater success. They achieved more. And I'm not sure that they would have accomplished the mission if he did not have that leading with love built into who he was. So, well, and an example of that is that every other leader before him did not accomplish it. They had the same resources. They had the same support from President Lincoln and Secretary of War Stanton. They had the same amount of troops. You know, they had vastly more uh, forces than the Southern troops, but they lost again and again and again. And one of the reasons is that the commanders before Grant except for Meade. Meade was a good man, but he didn't have the tenacity and the vision that Grant had, but he was a good general. And that's why Grant kept him on as head of the Army of the Potomac, while Grant was the head of all the armies. And Grant traveled with Meade, but all the commanders before that, they were they didn't have that same kind of leading with love. It was very much about them and pomp and circumstances. McClellan, who was a very uh, talented organizer, now they called him the young Napoleon because he had that kind of audacious attitude and very much, you know, I'm better than you. And he failed miserably on the battlefield. And so it's very clear that the best organizations, and this is another thing that Collins uh, said, he said that in in their good to great research, uh, they looked at companies that had gone from good, decent companies to truly amazing, great companies. And he said every single leader were servant leaders, every single one, it was about them disappearing into the organization and letting the organization be the star rather than them being the star. Exactly. It's about making their people look good instead of trying to make themselves look good. And I've seen exactly. the same thing in in my work. When you have a leader who is deeply insecure and they're always trying to make themselves, to elevate themselves, if you have that, they're going to fall. But if you have a leader who has that security to say, you know what, it's not about me. It's about us. It's about them. It's about this organization. And so if I need to even hide behind the scenes or what I sometimes call be the engine beneath the hood where you're invisible to the outside world, but you really are the one driving that thing and maybe even exactly. leading your people where they don't even realize they've been led. That's exceptional leadership. And I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Well, in Chapter six, you talked about tough calls. And I know that Grant had to make many tough calls. And leaders in today's world will sometimes have to make tough calls. Can you describe to us maybe what you mean by a tough call? And then, you know, have, what is the, the connection between the way Grant maybe had to make some tough calls and today's leader might? Absolutely. And one of the reasons that the Union Army was not successful before Grant, uh, especially in the East fighting Robert E. Lee, is that they would attack Lee. Lee would be in defenses. He, well, you know, we need to remember that Robert E. Lee was uh, one of the greatest engineers in American military history. He built <laughs> several of the fortresses on the East Coast that are still there today. I used to live in Virginia Beach, and we would go over to Fortress Monroe, 
which had a, a museum and it had a, a, a lot of interesting things. Well, Robert E. Lee built Fortress Monroe, which is still standing to this day. Wow. He knew how to build fortifications. He knew how to defend his army. And these Union commanders before Grant would attack him in these strongholds and just be blown away. And then what they would do is they would retreat back across the Rapidan and the Rappahannock to uh, strategic rivers that kind of kept the two armies separated. And they would lick their wounds, they would refit, they would get more troops, and it would take them sometimes three, four, five months before they attack again. And Grant said, enough of this. Grant understood that Lee was vulnerable in that he had uh, way fewer troops and that there were no new troops to pull on. All of the troops that, all of the young men that were available were in the trenches. And so this is one of the places where Benjamin Butler, one of the other uh, Union commanders, said they're robbing from the cradle and the grave. And that's one of the first places you see that in the literature, Mm -hmm. that phrase, because they were taking young boys 12 years old and they were taking old men in their 50s and 60s. Well, I shouldn't say old because that's where I am, but uh, (laughs) older men in their 50s and 60s. Uh, because they were running out of troops, whereas the North had an endless supply. I mean, far more troops and people available in the North than in the South. Grant understood this, and so he knew that what needed to happen, the tough call that you talked about, was that they needed to engage the Confederacy and never let go. And so when Lincoln realized what Grant was doing, there were some people who told Grant, you need to send some troops to Washington to protect Washington. And and Lincoln overruled them and said, no, he said, you get a hold of their neck and keep chewing and choking. And so Lincoln understood what Grant was doing. It was a war of attrition. And every soldier from the Confederacy that was killed or captured or wounded that shrunk the Southern army where the North just maintained, not only maintained its size, but Lincoln made sure that they kept adding more troops um, so that they knew that eventually they were going to overwhelm the, the South. However, that meant some of the worst fighting that happened in the Civil War. So the Battle of the Wilderness, Grant actually didn't want to fight that battle. And a lot of people you know, blame Grant uh, for terrible suffering that happened in the wilderness because it was a thick forest. And so they could hardly see. And when the when the uh, guns started going, it got filled with smoke and then uh, the leaves caught on fire. And so there was fire. And so you had wounded soldiers who were burned alive. Uh, It was terrible. There were trees, you know, the branches would burn and then these big heavy branches would fall onto the troops and kill them or wound them. It was a really terrible battle. But Grant, he wanted to get through the wilderness, but Lee stopped him and said, I've got the advantage. I take away the advantage of the Union artillery in numbers by fighting in this thicket. And so they fought. A lot of people blame Grant, but Grant uh, said, listen, if Lee wants to fight, we're going to fight because every battle we are whittling him down. And so then the next battle was the Battle of the of uh, Spotsylvania, which is some of the worst fighting that there ever were. And after the battle, they found men in the mud, like 10 men deep that oh. got killed, fell into the mud and then someone else got killed, fell on top of them. Someone else got killed and fell on top of them. I mean, it was just a terrible, terrible battle, but Grant knew that this is what has to happen in order for us to win. And uh, Mary Lincoln, Mary Todd Lincoln said, Grant is a butcher and he's not fit to uh, be at the head of troops, but Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee both said, when people called him a butcher, they both said, no, he's doing exactly what needs to be done. And so another uh, very tragic uh, battle was the a couple battles after that, which was called Cold Harbor. And this was the one battle that Grant, in his memoirs, admitted and said, uh, I always regretted the second and third uh, assaults at Cold Harbor because it There was terrible loss, and we gained very little advantage. Uh, But the thing was is that they were only – they could hear the bells 
in the bell towers in Richmond. They were that close, 10 to 15 miles away. And so even though uh, Lee uh, Grant knew that Lee was entrenched, uh, he said, you know, if we don't attack, then we're going to be criticized that we were this close and didn't attack. And so they attacked and it was a terrible union defeat, but Grant had to do it. He had to make that tough call and he got all kinds of credit to this day. He gets criticism for cold Harbor, but it's from people who don't understand the bigger picture. So then the final part of the, of the answer to your question is that the night before they stepped across the Rapitan river and engaged Lee in what is called the overland campaign campaign in May of 1863, Grant met with his top uh, staff and generals, and he, on a chalkboard or whatever it was, he drew a picture of Richmond, and then he drew a big semicircle around it, and he and he put an X down in the south near Petersburg, and he said, when we get here, Lee is mine. Mm-hmm. And what he meant was he knew that That was the undefended place in the same way that in Vicksburg, he went around the South and knew that that was the undefended part of Vicksburg. He did the exact same thing in Richmond, only in the opposite direction. Instead of going South and East, he went South and West. And so his order was always moved by the left flank, moved by the left flank, moved by the left flank. And they kept moving further and further and Lee kept losing troops And uh, at one point, uh, just before Cold Harbor, Lee said to one of his generals, Jubal Early, he said, we must stop Grant and this army before they get to the James River, because if they get to the James, it will become a siege and it will only be a matter of time. So Lee could see exactly what Grant was doing. Grant had projected this before they ever started the battles. And after Cold Harbor, Uh, Grant did his famous work in that he sent the cavalry to the north of Richmond. He sent one battalion or one division of the infantry south of Richmond as a feint to make Lee think they were attacking. And then Grant, in the middle of the night and silently, took all the other divisions of the army. It was like 80,000 men, and they quietly left their trenches he had had his engineers build a bridge across the James river, which was 80 feet deep tidal river. It had never been done before. It was an unbelievable risk. He was risking his army, but they did it. And they walked across silently, you know, out of these trenches. And then they walked across the water and they got to Petersburg and it became a siege. And that was the end of the, of the war. And so, um, those were the tough calls he had to make. He had to get through the wilderness. He had to get through Spotsylvania. He had to get through Cold Harbor so that he could get to the ultimate goal, which is laying siege and then chewing and choking until the Confederates came to their knees. It would be a very different world that we live in today if it had not been for Grant's tenacity. And I know you talked about he his understanding that sometimes you have to put constant pressure on a strategy in order to implement it and in order to execute and have that success. And I love one of the the terms that you pointed out that Abraham Lincoln said of Ulysses S. Grant that he had dogged pertinacity to accomplish great <laughs> things. Yes. And, and I think that, you know, that may be a strange term to us in the 21st century, but I think many in leadership would do well to take that as a mantle for themselves and say, I am going to exhibit dogged pertinacity so that we can accomplish great things. And if that means you have to be as creative as Grant did in building that bridge, like you said, we take bridges for granted today across rivers such as as the James. But back in his day, that was a new innovation. And and it was a pontoon bridge uh, Mm -hmm. because they didn't have the time uh, to build some sort of a suspension bridge or a traditional bridge. The river was too wide and it was too deep and it was a tidal river. So it rose and fell. And so they, they, it was very innovative in that they used pontoons and then they used cables to stretch those pontoons. And they used uh, both the shoreline and ships out at sea under anchor 
to hold it in place. Wow. It truly was an engineering marvel, and yet the troops walked across it like they were walking on a path. It was an amazing moment in the history of the Civil War that most people miss, but that in my book, Victor, The Final Battle of Ulysses S. Grant, it's a centerpiece because it truly was kind of, uh, not kind of, there are historians, and I'm one, who says that that was when the war was won. Mm. And uh, Lee was completely fooled. He went after the bait of the one division to the south and the uh, cavalry to the north. He thought that they were being attacked. And so he took his eye. It's like the eye of Sauron, you know, in, in Lord of the Rings, because Aragorn was at the gate uh, he was diverting Sauron from looking at Frodo and Sam, which was the real deal of what was happening, taking the ring into Mordor. And Grant did the same thing in Vicksburg, and he did the same thing in Richmond, and that's why he won. Consider the war analogy. We, in leadership, if you are working for an organization, your competitors – you could look at them as somewhat like the enemy, right? And so there are creativities and strategies that are necessary in order to overcome the enemy. But even everyday problems can be considered our enemy. And if we are willing to apply that constant pressure and to envision and think strategically and to be creative and to try new things Oftentimes, not only does that help us overcome and ar arrive at a solution faster, but it also helps us emotionally because now we're focused on something positive instead of just you know, speaking all of that negativity into ourselves. And I think in order to be an exceptional leader, we have to really take control of that self-talk instead of letting our self-talk control us as Grant was very adept at that. Yeah, absolutely. And he was uh, someone who understood his weaknesses and did what was necessary to overcome those. For example, there was, there were a couple different examples in this book. I have a whole chapter in forward about Grant overcoming his alcoholism and, um, he did that uh, by surrounding himself with accountability. It's a fascinating thing to see what he did in the 1860s and 1870s to overcome. And when I say overcome, I mean he was always an alcoholic. That's part of the disease. But he got to the point of abstinence by having someone like John Rollins, who, you know, there was one time when Grant seriously fell off the wagon during the Vicksburg campaign. And it was because he Rollins was not there and they were doing some reconnaissance up the Yazoo river and Grant was not feeling well. And his doctor prescribed alcohol to him. Well, Grant wasn't thinking he was busy thinking about the war and he starts taking this medicine and all of a sudden he's off on a bender and he is flat out drunk. And part of the problem was that Grant was, uh, he, he couldn't handle liquor very well. Mm -hmm. And so he would only drink a little bit and be, uh, they called it stupid drunk. You know, when he got back from this and word got back to Rollins, Rollins went off in public <laughs> berating Grant saying, what were you thinking? I, you promised me that you wouldn't do this. And Grant was apologetic. And so Rollins went into every tent of every officer that was part of the staff as all surrounding Grant and looked through every footlocker and took all the alcohol and went out onto a stump and he broke every bottle wow. on the stump. Well, right after this, uh, you know, Grant realized that he had, you know, put himself in danger uh, because everyone was looking for him to fail uh, with the alcoholism. And so Grant called his wife and said, you need to come and be with me. Because whenever Julia was there, he didn't drink. Mm. And so for most of the war, Julia stayed with Ulysses. In fact, my son and I went to the uh, City Point uh, location where Grant's headquarters was, just outside of Petersburg. And his cabin uh, that uh, Rufus Ingalls, the quartermaster of the Army of the Potomac, had built is still there. Uh, and it has a meeting room in the front and two bedrooms in the back, one for he and Julia and one for their kids when they came to visit. 
But Julia stayed with him in this little cabin for most of that last year of the war, um, and it kept Grant accountable. And then later on, you know, people would offer him a drink, and he put his hand over the the uh, glass. And in one particular uh, instance, one of the generals is quoted as saying uh, he offered Grant a drink, and Grant said. Uh, no, I, I no longer do that because if I start, I, I can't stop. And so, you know, you talk about self-talk and you talk about knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. Grant came to know that this was a weakness. And so he did what he had to do to overcome that weakness. Um, and so, you know, once he got to the White House, he he didn't drink other than when they would give a toast in, you know, when they would have a a diplomat or a head of state come to the White House, Grant would pretend to drink. He'd put it to his lips and then he'd put it down and wouldn't do a, he wouldn't take any more. But in the background, at the meals, uh, they never drank alcohol at all. Well, and I love the fact that he held himself accountable and he was willing to admit his weaknesses. You know, we see that today in leadership too often as a detriment, but in fact, that is a courageous step that we can take to overcome those weaknesses when we actually tell other people or we ask for help must not have been easy for him to ask his wife to come and hold him accountable, but his willingness to do so is what set him apart. And so I love the inner strength that he had to do that. Well, Craig, I want to talk about something else too, because it's so relevant to today's leaders. And this is one of those areas that I often teach and train in when it comes to leaders, because leaders will express their frustration to me about employees or middle management that they've given direction to, and then not seeing the follow through on that that they want. But oftentimes what I find when I dig into that a little bit deeper It's a matter of there being confusion about what the instructions were. And so you say this about Grant, that he understood that we need to communicate both verbally and in writing with clarity, directness, simplicity, manifesting truthfulness, fairness, and justice toward friend and foe alike. So there's a couple of things I want to bring up about that and why this really struck me. One, I often tell leaders that I'm working with, when you verbalize something to someone, that first time that they hear it, they're only going to retain approximately 25% of what you just said by statistics and study. So having that knowledge, we need to take responsibility and ownership to follow through and make sure that they understand everything that they need to in order to accomplish that task. And so I often tell people, back it up, put something in black and white to substantiate what you've just said to them. And it also gives a lot of people the comfort and confidence in knowing they can refer back to that and and kind of remind themselves they're on the right track. That may seem like a lot of extra work, but it can save so much money, time and energy just by doing that. Absolutely. Yes. And, and with Grant though, he also had the wisdom to understand it's not just that you back it up in black and white. I know leaders that will take a very simple task and write a, a four page manifesto on that, but Grant understood the importance of doing that with clarity, directness, and simplicity. So what are your thoughts about that in leadership today and and Grant's insights about that? Again and again in the literature, you hear uh, subordinates speaking, and not only subordinates, but also Stanton and Lincoln, speaking of how Grant's orders and his letters were so clear uh, they weren't, uh, there wasn't a lot of flowery speech, but it was just to the point, uh, here's what needs to, needs to be done, A, B, C, and D. It was very, very clear. And so Grant would uh, kind of have a one-two approach. He would speak with his commanders, those who were around him, but then he would always follow up with written uh, orders. And he was constantly writing out orders. It's interesting. The um, 
there are a couple of places. One is one excellent example of this is Chattanooga, which I had mentioned earlier. He had come in. Uh, General Rosecrans uh, had lost at Chickamauga to the Confederates and was pushed back into Chattanooga. And then the Confederates surrounded Chattanooga, and he was kind of in this bowl with the army. Lincoln said Rosecrans is like a duck that's been hit on the head. He just was, you know, out of out of control. And so Lincoln uh, gave Grant the, you know, the right. Do you, if you want to retain him, great. If not, then General Thomas uh, is is next in line. Well, Grant had tremendous respect for Thomas. And so Grant didn't hesitate at all. He fired Rosecrans and he brought in Thomas. And then he himself came into Chattanooga. He was uh, he had been injured from a fall from his horse. He had been severely injured after Vicksburg. He had been in bed and his leg was uh, very, very uh, wounded. And yet when the order came from Lincoln to go to Chattanooga, he got out of his bed, got on a train and then when they got close to Chattanooga, he had to over the mountains to get into Chattanooga. And he came to General Thomas's headquarters and all of the he had gathered all of the leadership and said, tell me what's going on. And so they for a couple of hours, they sat by the fire as Grant warmed himself and all these different leaders were giving the information. And Grant took it all in. And when he was done, he asked for his order book. He had like this notebook. And it said that uh, the literature says that he sat there uh, for many, many uh, minutes and really probably more than an hour writing orders and throwing them on the table in front of him. Some of them actually fell onto the floor because there were so many orders that he was writing. He had taken in the information and then immediately went to work. Even that night, the first night he was there, you know, shivering in pain. Uh, under siege from the Confederate army. And he just started putting them out one after the other and beginning, you know, even that night they started to implement these orders. And within only three or four days, they were able to break open the siege, bring in the supplies and everything turned around and Chattanooga became a victory rather than a defeat. And um, we saw that with Grant again and again, where he would make very clear uh, what his orders were. Now, conversely, uh, and sadly, there was a time when um, his orders were not fulfilled, and unfortunately, he was not there to make sure that they were fulfilled because, again, we were talking earlier about when you're in charge of a large organization, there are some times where there are things happening that you don't see. And so what had happened is that I spoke earlier about the Union Army crossing the James on that pontoon uh, bridge and then uh, laying siege to, to Petersburg. Well, they actually could have walked right into Petersburg and possibly right into Richmond, but um, the commander uh, was uh, both exhausted. He had had, uh, they called it uh, James Fever, which was uh, likely uh, either uh, cholera or something similar to it, dysentery. Um, and so he was sick. And then the second commander that came up uh, was had been wounded at Gettysburg, and his wound had broken open again. And so he was out of out of sorts. Everybody was exhausted from this uh, move from uh, the trenches there at Cold Harbor and across the river. And so they got there and they could have walked right in, but everybody was exhausted. And Grant was busy running this, you know, all the armies across the entire continent. And so he wasn't there to give the command. And those commanders that had his commands were not fulfilling those commands. Mm. And so unfortunately, there was enough time for Lee to recognize the danger and get troops down to Petersburg. And by the time Grant got there, uh, there was really nothing that he could do. He had given orders, but those orders weren't followed through. And so that's, again, one of the dangers that happens. Uh, you know, they could have gone in and it might have been a month of siege. It ended up being nine months of siege wow. that ha that took place until they were able to finally, uh, you know, push the Confederates out of those trenches and then surround them at Appomattox. So it's a, an excellent example uh, 
of you might have a really great leader, but if your subordinates are not following the orders for whatever reason, and the leader is not following up with those orders for whatever reason, you can have a difficulty that arises that can be a real problem. And so again, it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, diligence and communication. Yes, absolutely. Well, Craig, in our last few minutes, I want to talk about conflict because all of us in any type of leadership that we're going to have, we're going to deal with conflict at times. And I love some things that Grant innately understood about conflict, that when you enter into any conflict with the goal of inflicting the least amount of suffering, I love the grace that he exhibited in that. You know, he could have gloated over some of the defeats that he was able to enact on some of his enemies, but he did not do that. And he knew that it was important to be gracious in victory and not to gloat over the downfall or setback opponent. And he recognized the power of offering help when someone else needed it the most. And so let's talk a little bit about conflict just in a couple of minutes here and why it's important for leaders not to try to to even take it to a higher level of maybe stripping someone of their dignity. So just because you win doesn't mean that you need to rip other people apart. And I really believe that Grant understood that from, from what I've read of your book. The showpiece of what you're speaking of is the surrender at Appomattox. It truly was a uh, one of the most important moments in American history in that uh, Grant did what you're speaking of. Grant could have came in and humiliated the South. He could have uh, taken away their horses. He could have taken away their sidearms. He could have imprisoned uh, the commanders of uh, the Confederate armies, uh, but he recognized, and, and part of this was Grant, and part of it was Lincoln's direction, because Lincoln was the same. They were comrades. They were brothers. They saw things from uh, the same servant leadership point of view. Lincoln had been one of the best uh, wrestlers in Illinois. He only lost once, and it was because the guy cheated. Um, <laughs> he was very strong, and and he was a great wrestler. And so when they were planning what was going to happen after the war, uh, Lincoln used a wrestling metaphor in talking with Sherman and Grant and Admiral Porter in there, it was on the River Queen on the James River. They were making their plans because they knew that the end was in sight. And Lincoln said to him, let them up easy. And it's just like a wrestler. Once you have them pinned, then you get up and you become a gentleman and you pull them up. You let them up easy. And, and Lincoln said, I don't want tribunals. I don't want hangings. I don't want firing squads. That happened in the French Revolution that happened in other civil wars, and it just makes the war go on, and sometimes it erupts a couple decades later because you never reconciled. And so when Grant went in to meet with General Lee when he surrendered, it was really interesting because Lee wore his best uniform that he had kept packed away only for the best occasions. He was wearing a gilded sword and and he uh, had gotten all dressed up and some of his commanders, you know, his troops were starving. They were all in threadbare uniforms. And his commander said, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I think I must be General Grant's prisoner. And so I want to make my best appearance. Oh, wow. Grant showed up in his private's uniform with just the stars on his shoulder. His boots and his legs were covered in mud because he had been riding his horse all of his nice clothes and his sword were way back, miles and miles behind in some wagon. And so he was embarrassed uh, that he was coming to the surrender. And yet it has an amazing metaphoric type of symbolism where basically the colonial past was surrendering to the common man future. Mm. And it was an amazing moment where here is General Lee, the son of one of General Washington's top aides on his staff, Light Horse Harry Lee. He is 
as aristocratic as they come. His blood was as blue as it flowed. You know, the first family of Virginia, the Lees, handing over his sword to the son of a tanner from the frontier. Fascinating, amazing moment in American history. And Grant could have made it a class kind of thing and took the sword and took, you know, stripped him of, of his medals or whatever he, was, he would do. But instead, uh, Grant was very gracious. And actually, Grant went beyond, beyond his authority. But uh, Lincoln backed it up. In the surrender document, Grant said, if the Confederates will lay down their arms and return peaceably to their farms and to their homes, they will not be harassed by the federal government as long as they obey the laws of the land. Well, that's clemency. Wow. That is a pardon. Mm-hmm. Grant did not really have the authority to pardon. Only the president can do that. But Grant knew Lincoln's heart so well that he wrote that into the document. And then that was tested because Lincoln was assassinated only a week later. And President Johnson, uh, Andrew Johnson, came to power. Now, Andrew Johnson was from a southern state, Tennessee, and he had remained loyal to the Union. And he was very angry with his fellow Southerners, and he wanted revenge. And so there was a gathering in Richmond or in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, grand jury indicted Lee Longstreet and some of the other leaders of the Confederacy, and they wanted to capture them and hang them. Mm. So when Lee got word of this, he contacted General Grant. He didn't go to President uh, Johnson because he knew he was an enemy. He went to Grant and he said, you promised clemency, and we've done our part. We've, we've maintained the peace. And uh, Grant went to Johnson and uh, said, listen, President Lincoln and I put this in here because we knew that if we didn't, that a large part of the Confederate Army could go into the hills, and then we would have a guerrilla war for years and years to come, and maybe it would never end. But by doing this, by humbling ourselves, by being gracious, we – accepted these people back as our brethren. And we said, we will not harass you if you don't harass us. Andrew Johnson said, I don't care. We're going to hang them. They're, they're traitors. And, and Grant said, if you do that, then I will resign and I will fight you. Mm. And Andrew Johnson knew that Grant was the most popular person in the United States at that time. And so he backed down. And so Grant saved the life of Lee and Longstreet and others uh, by his graciousness And that is why when Grant died 20 years later of throat cancer, there were several regiments from the South that went to New York City and marched in his funeral. And that is something you simply don't see after a civil war. No, and that is a unifying leader. And boy, in today's world, could we not use more of that? Craig, such good stuff there. I, I know we're going a little bit long, but I want to ask you one final question today. And and I'm just struck by what you just shared about that. Boy, I wish some of our leaders would humble themselves the way that Grant did. I wish that our leaders would have the courage to extend grace and to show integrity, doing the same thing, whether anyone else can see or hear you or not. and just to lift our nation up instead of tearing it down. Yes. But Craig, let me ask you this final question. If you could ask Ulysses S. Grant one question, one to one, leader to leader, what would that question be? Wow, what an excellent, excellent question. I think that I would ask him, why did you feel it was necessary? to run for president when you never wanted to be president. Oh, this was a time, you know, Grant, (laughs) Grant's an interesting guy. Grant wanted to be a mathematics professor. That was his big (laughs) goal. Wow. (laughs) Uh, People don't realize this. He loved mathematics. He was very good at it. He uh, excelled at mathematics at West Point and he wanted to come back to West Point as a mathematics professor. (laughs) That was his desire. He wanted to live a a peaceful life raising horses. He actually, uh, there in St. Louis, built an amazing uh, barn 
to uh, keep all of his horses. He had been, when he traveled the world after being president, he, uh, he was given two Arabian stallions by the, uh, the Sultan of uh, Constantinople and, uh, you know, the head over the Ottoman Empire, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. So he brought these horses to America, and some of our great thoroughbreds that still race today are direct descendants of these stallions. Oh and so he sent these horses to this stable in St. Louis at their Whitehaven farm that he had purchased from his father-in-law, who was ruined, you know, because he was a slave owner. And, after, you know, when the war broke out, his father was ruined right at the time that Grant was, you know, achieving all of this. And so they rescued the father and let him live there at Whitehaven. And so that was the home that Ulysses and Julia always wanted to go back to, mm. and they never did. And it's it's an amazing kind of melancholy when you go to this home and you tour it. It's now, you know, the U.S. Grant uh, National Park there, run by the National Park Service. And there is their beautiful home surrounded by trees and there is this barn that he built for his horses, these stables that now are part of the museum, which is really cool. It's the original barn, but they've renovated it into part of the museum. And Grant never got to go back home. And it was because he knew it was his duty to serve his country. He knew that no one else could step into the presidency after the disaster of the almost four years of Andrew Johnson. Uh, Andrew Johnson, of course, was uh, impeached by the uh, Republican Congress because, you know, he kept uh, vetoing their legislation to help the former slaves. And he came down to just one vote. By one vote, he was uh, kept in office. If that one vote would have went the other way, he would have been sent out of office. And so Grant knew that it was his duty to take up the flag of freedom the flag of abolition, the flag of equal rights that had been dropped when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And Grant carried that flag forward. He pushed through the Civil Rights Act of 1875 that restored equal rights, regardless of race, color, creed, religion, etc. He pushed through the forming of the Department of Justice that we have today. And he said to his Attorney General, go after the Klan and drive them out of business. He told his army commanders, go after the Klan and drive them out of business. And then he pushed through with, in, in cooperation with the Republicans in Congress, two anti-KKK laws. And through those laws, which had teeth in them, and through the left and right hook of the army and the Attorney General, he pushed the KKK underground and they were out of business for the next 15 to 20 years after Grant left the White House, but he had drove them underground. Now they eventually emerged and became more powerful than ever, but that was because you didn't have a Ulysses S. Grant. Mm -hmm. And then that Civil Rights Act of 1875 was overturned by the Supreme Court and it led to 80 years of Jim Crow racism. We had to go through the whole civil rights movement and then an assassination of another president in order to have the Congress have the guts to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which basically restored what Grant had pushed through in his administration. So if I was sitting down with him, I would say to him, tell me why you never went back to your farm. Tell me why you never raised your horses. Tell me why for the rest of your life you served your country. I think that would be a fascinating conversation. I think it would too. And in listening to you, Craig, this is what it makes me think of. Some of us choose leadership and some of us are thrust into leadership. But regardless of how that originated, it always comes back to, are we leading exceptionally well? And when we do, we can change lives. We can transform nations we can make a massive difference in the world. And I believe that we are all created to do that. And it starts with where we are, where we're at today. Well, Craig, thank you so much for joining us for part two of this. 
again, get Craig's book, Forward the Leadership Principles of Ulysses S. Grant. There's so much that we can find in history. So if we would learn the first time, we don't have to keep repeating and making all of these do-overs that are so expensive to us, not just financially, but to our hearts, our souls, and our minds. And so let's not be part of losing leadership, the art of leadership. Let's be a part of restoring that lost art of exceptional leadership today. And just remember this, no matter what position you're in, whether you're leading in a large corporate organization or whether you're leading in your home, you have a choice in how you go about that. You, by decision, can make a difference if you will just choose to lead exceptionally well. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Exceptional Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Anita Brooks. And I just want to remind you of a truth. If you are not leading at the level that you want to be at, remember, it is never too late for a fresh start with fresh faith. You can start today. You can start making a difference. You can help the world become a better place. You can begin to lead with intent, your family, your friends, the people you work with, your community, in your church, in our nation, across the planet. Whatever opportunities come your way, remember that did not happen by accident. And by stepping up and leading exceptionally well, you will help fulfill the purpose you were created for.